Yeah, you know, the depth of it, you know, you have to really contemplate. Because we're saying one thing and maybe it's, it just passes over people as, you know, oh that's interesting. But to meditate and contemplate that, you know, when they're talking about muraqaba, they're talking about making a connection, the immensity of the, the reality of the soul and its magnetic charge. That to use your body as a vehicle in which to connect. So that the iron within your body that makes your blood to be red, to purify the blood, purify the iron, you do all the zikrs, all the practices and then begin to make that charge, that becomes an eternal magnet in which Allah begin to charge your reality in the direction of the love of the Divine the Presence. When Allah finds sincerity in the character of that person begins to guide them to what he loves and he loves the reality of Sayyidina Muhammad why? He's a treasure wanting to be known, he said, I want you when I love you, I want you to really find me. Not at that imam, not over there, not over there but I want you to find really my treasure, direct yourself to the love of Sayyidina Muhammad that becomes the qibla and, and the, the understanding of my direction. In anyone I follow to teach me about that, when I'm solid and secure about the qibla then they have to be solid like that. They have to be following sharia, they have to be following the sunnah, they have to be following the example and the way of where I'm trying to reach. So that becomes the safeguard of the heart and the safeguard of the compass. Sayyidina Abu Bakr as Siddiq said, if for a moment you see that I have left the sharia and I left the sunnah, I give you permission to walk away from me. So means that's an immense reality, that's a safeguard in our connection. So our whole life is to direct towards that qibla, to the direction and to the love of Sayyidina Muhammad to reach towards that ishq and to that love. As a result Allah turns the magnet on, Allah begin to make the attraction to be more and more powerful inshaAllah. And that's why then all of these other actions so that to make your magnet strong, connect two, three days a week for your association. What could be a more powerful association than to be sitting with ashiqeen who will be chanting and talking in the direction of that love then to inspire you go out and do charity. So that Allah by the means of charity Allah covers the imperfection in the character. Don't we have that in Ramadan? The kafa, right? Because you say, all this time I fasted but of course I made mistakes and errors. Allah by means of zakah and charity, charity and zakah is a purification. That take away the imperfection of that amal as it's going to be packaged and presented to the presence of Allah So means it's a whole system that we do. At the videos at the end there's a charity button, click on that button and give a small donation. That seals that understanding, that seals the zikr, that seals the event. Go out and be of service, live a life through all of these vehicles that have been put together to perfect this ishq and this mass attraction to the presence and the love of Sayyidina Muhammad Then the people feel then the magnetic pull and the juzbah and the attraction to the ishq and love of Sayyidina Muhammad And once that hits it's very powerful. It's immensely powerful, it becomes a lifelong pull into that reality. It's the love of Prophet that makes everyone to continue to do what they do and continue to compete to do more because they want more of that love and they describe that they go. I think Mawlana would talk from Burda Sharif that some come to Prophet for a handful some come to the presence of Prophet for a cup full and some come like rivers full. That they're all coming, all pious people are coming in their souls and in their spirituality to the presence of the kawtha and asking grant us from this kawtha of yours. Either they take a handful because nobody leaves with nothing from Prophet or they take a cup full 
or they take oceans and rivers full. But who are the ones taking oceans and rivers full? Is the ones that have an ocean and a river to distribute. Means the da'wah is strong, the people they reach are many. As a result Prophet give to them like rivers and oceans of abundance because he knows they're going to be people who disseminate that reality out so that everybody can drink from that kawthar of Sayyidina Muhammad inshaAllah. Assalamu alaikum Sayyidi Can you please explain about the reality of Surat al-Hadid? <coughs> Surat al-Hadid I think we talked many many years ago, long time ago that had to do with the reality of Sayyidina Mahdi and that has to do with the reality of, of iron and in holy books one would be coming uh, on a white horse with an iron rod and that is a, a symbol of the reality of Sayyidina Mahdi who comes and represents the perfection of hadith, it represents the perfection of iron within insan because the perfection of their iron is symbolic of the perfection of their guidance, that their guidance is clean, their system is clean, their blood is clean. As a result of that cleanliness and good action their iron is shining. Well, if your iron is shining it means what? You are picking up maximum tajalli, maximum fires and emanations. So that was symbolic of that reality of Sayyidina Mahdi that the, the firmness of guidance, the realities of guidance and then the many realities of the number 57 and iron. That iron is an element by understanding the reality of iron is an element that's not from the earth, comes from the heavens and is then sort of found upon this earth. There's also similar understandings in the reality of gold. So they say that gold is from the rays of the sun, we can't make gold and gold is, is not made on earth. Gold again comes from the heavens onto the earth, heavens being the sama space. But they say not only space but actually the rays of the sun they send the element of gold upon this earth. And that's why this gold has a value when Allah describes currency as gold and silver. It has a value, has a reality. But for hadid and iron has a reality in, 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 in power and in guidance. So Allah mentions it and gives the number of the surah as 57 and the periodic table mentions the 57 in relationship to iron. So I mean it's known that Allah gave to them a symbol and a reality of 57 and iron and through the periodic table has a number of 57 within it. I think it's 57, I'm not memorizing the periodic table but there's a reference towards hadith, iron and 57 from Qur'an, one of the miracles of Qur'an for their science world. But the reality of iron that it's not, it's not made on earth that it's extremely powerful element. The amount of force that it captures within its element is again like the symbol of Sayyidina Mahdi That it looks like an element like any other metal but if you crack it open the amount of force that comes out of iron is immense, is an immense element. So it means it's contained with so much power just to keep it closed, that's why we can't make it. That it's not found, it's, it's being brought onto earth because the amount of power needed to keep that element together. But if you break the element the amount of force that it releases is extreme. So shaitan took that understanding for warfare. So he produced a bomb 
which has an iron ball and he put a nuclear contaminant inside of it. And when he explodes that ball, the nuclear waste is distributed and that's the concept of their bomb. So shaitan uses that secret and weaponizes to the harm of humanity. For the heavens is teaching us, no use that secret for the guidance of humanity, not to harm humanity, perfect your iron, understand the reality of the iron within your body that makes your blood to be red. That's why the color for Sayyidina Mahdi is on the qalbu sir on the sir, the red lataif. And the red lataif has to do with the reality of the element of iron and that the iron makes your body to be red, your blood to be red. And Sayyidina Mahdi is representing red and red has to do with warfare, right? So it's not the warfare against people that shaitan is trying to do when he weaponizes iron but the warfare against devils. So your greatest fight is if your iron is pure and clean. As a result of your energy and juzbah you have the ability to fight that which is seen and unseen and that your guidance is purified and perfected by the perfection of the iron of the body inshaAllah. As Salaamu Sayyidi Walaykum As Salaam wa rahmatullah Can you please tell us about the end times when there is a trial of gold which the world is facing this year? This year? <laughs> the world is facing a trial every year and has, has been increased. Most important regarding the end times is what have we done to prepare for it? That we see the signs everywhere of difficulty and what are we doing to prepare for that difficulty? So the signs where you have to before maybe convince people of the alamat and give all these hadiths and they sit down and say, okay maybe, maybe not. Really we're way beyond that, nobody needs that anymore. They see these signs every day, COVID locked this down, the whole earth shut down, no, no oil was pumped. Those were all immense signs. The whole world was put into fear with something that was not even seen. Banking collapsed, everything collapsed. So those alamats are so clear now, it's a matter of which people want to believe on how to purify themselves. And we said, these sicknesses keep rolling and that's why we described them last night and you should study what a parasite is and how something can overtake you. Understand what is the concept of a virus? Virus is, is something in which to manipulate something. What is the definition of a virus? Is to introduce something to overtake the faculties of something else? I don't know what the definition is but you use it in technology to overtake their computer. So all of these words that are being used then they should be listening to the haqqaiqs and understand something's trying to overtake me and they, they want my eyes, they want my hearing, they want my speaking, they want my entire faculty to be surrendered to them. And if I too weak and die they think that's better anyways because you're, you're old, we don't need you. So they want the powerful, the young. And at the same time Allah is warning and teaching because if you believe that these teachings are a guidance from the heavens, if you believe that. If you believe that then the theme that coming from the heavens is, well why you don't give your faculties back to us? The heavens wants your hearing, wants your seeing, wants your breathing, wants your hands, your feet and the heavens will give you an eternal reward and they'll grant you to be Rabbaniyoon. And at some point in time Allah will start opening the power of, kun fayakun. Well then that's very powerful, that's it, immense heavens which has no limit, has no downtime, has no nothing that can be finished. If heavenly power comes to the servant it doesn't finish. The soul's power is eternal moving, it's not like they have to zap something and then wait for a recharge and do something again. Is Allah ignite the servant 
from Allah's eternal oceans and which has no beginning and no ending. So insan is now is being fought over. Heaven's warning that don't give yourself and come back towards the heavenly reality, inshaAllah. As-salamu alaykum Sayyidi Walaykum Uh, is there any side effect to a jinn attack? Yeah, you become possessed. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen the people on the street? Schizophrenic and mentally they're, they're destroyed and they're talking to somebody. You don't see that one but that one is there and they're talking to them, talking to many of them. The, many of this hallucinogenics and all these things, it's this, this crazy system that's opening. There's a, there's, a, there's a chemical that they take from the bushes and the jungles of Peru and the people are spending, wealthy people who have nothing else better to do, they're going to the jungles of these witch doctors, drinking something and then saying that they're hallucinating and now they're seeing the spirit world. But anytime you take a hallucinogenic and you take a drug and an and alcohol, all of these reduce the veil that Allah sent as a rahmah for you. Bismillahir Rahmanir Raheem is a mercy for humans. But, but you know, people are their worst enemy. When you can't see, it's a blessing for you. Because if you're not trained and you see, you're called schizophrenic, right? Because you don't know what the heck you're seeing, why they're, you're seeing them, how they're coming and attacking you and, and, and saying horrific things for you to do to yourself and you can't push it away. So, no this is a mercy from Allah when He puts a veil and between you and what Allah has created. Allah has veiled the, the servant and this is an immense rahmah from Allah and that's why Allah says, don't ask for what would cause harm to you. So I mean don't ask to see something if you're not a person that has prepared yourself on how to repel, that you on firm on your madad, you're firm with your protection, you don't even have to ask at that time, Allah will open what He wants to open. If the one whom been trained and is taught, they don't ask for that because Allah will test them when Allah's ready and they don't want that. But when people are, are being fooled by their nafs and they go into these circumstances and do these horrific things, these are not things that close up again and that these are things that once you see them and they see you, they attach themselves to that person and their life is thousand years means they can be generational curses and difficulty upon a person. So that's not heavenly, that Allah doesn't want, which is why we described before, God is cleanliness and beautific character, beautific purity, extreme purity. That if you want to know what heavens are, look at Muslims, look at Ramadan, praying, fasting, keeping themselves to be clean and pure, that's the heavens. Allah doesn't need anyone to see angels go into a jungle smoke some ridiculous things, begin to throw up and hallucinate, they're not seeing angels. Angels don't uh, call you to do that, they're seeing horrific creatures that you weren't supposed to see anyways and you weren't supposed to communicate with them and definitely not supposed to get any guidance from them and they attach themselves to you, your family and your community because they start to move into them and they brought these things into these areas. So these are all the, the tricks from shayateen to cause immense harm to people. That something so simple as a board that they sell at the Walmart that's conjuring and calling. That's why we talked in the secrets of manifestation. You have the ability to conjure very horrific things. So if you sit and break your auzu and begin to summon something, you know Allah saying, you, you broke your protection, of course that devil is going to appear, that shayateen or marad are going to appear and begin to cause harm in that person's life for all of their life. And nobody will take it away, nobody will 
dare to try to take it away because you asked for it. So it means it, as, as much as people want to harm themselves it's all right there in front of them. That's the perfection of Islam that the first thing Allah gave to us, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitanir Rajeem, seek refuge in the accursed devil. Before you can know anything about the heavens seek refuge in the accursed devil. Means don't deal with the devil, seek refuge from his, his you know being accursed and move towards the Divine and keep yourself within the ocean of the Divine inshaAllah. <coughs> As Alaikum Ya Sayyidi Walaykum As Salaam wa rahmatullah Is it possible for the jinns to abduct humans, especially kids? Forgive me for my ignorance. Sure, <laughs> why, why would it not be? <clears throat> Many are abducted for them and because of them. And they're very simple for them to grab somebody and take them away and nobody will find that person again. So yeah. This is very, very, very common and it's uh, very common in certain parts of the world where they're very prevalent and that people know about them, the jungles and the deserts where people know about their existence and all of these difficulties on our earth is because of them. So if you get our teaching in, in a whole that they have overtaken the earth. Their technologies are means in which to entrap and slave, enslave insan and humanity upon this earth. They're beginning to manifest their reality entirely upon this earth. And this is all that what Prophet had taught us. Their leader and ruler is what we call the Dajjal, the man of great deceit and he's a jinn. And that's not to say that we have mu'min ones and protecting ones and all of that, but that's something completely separate. <clears throat> these sicknesses by them, these mental illnesses by them, these difficulties upon earth by them, these computers that are being introduced by them, these are their technologies. These are not the technologies Allah wants people to have. Allah wants people to live in a regular, common, humble home and pray and worship. It's the jinn and the shayateen that want humanity to become like batteries enslaved by technologies and then they become like the matrix put aside as a battery while the nefarious creatures can run and do what they want. So many of these realities then these are the realities of this dunya right now. InshaAllah Allah protect us, guide us towards the heavenly realities mm -hmm. and that to be in the presence of Sayyidina Mahdi upon this earth as mm -hmm. all these difficulties begin to come towards their end inshaAllah. Mm -hmm. As Salaamu Sayyidi <coughs> Walaykum As Salaam What can be the reality of bipolarity and is it allowed to study till late at night or night is created for sleep and rest? Yeah, I think, I think one of the shaykhs just gave a talk about night is for sleep. Yeah, so alhamdulillah, night is for sleep. Bipolarity is a separate subject than, than doing things at night. And uh, for those to sleep, they sleep and then Allah Qiyam al-Layl is in Qur'an that they wake up early, pray their Salatul Tahajjud, pray their Salatul Fajr and do their worshipness, take a little bit of rest and go out and work. So according to Islamic Sharia that's what the night is for. So Shaykh Dagestani, Sultanul Awliya would sleep very early and wake up very early for Tahajjud, have a lot of strong tea and pray a very vigilant Salatul Tahajjud and all the Nashbandi Salat all the way to the Fajr and would do it with a complete sort of awareness and strength. That's one thing, that's the separate thing on, on time management and, and how to perfect one's character. What was the first part of the question? The reality of bipolarity. 
Yeah, that's something completely not attached to waking up early in the night time yet. <laughs> the bipolarity we've discussed before is uh, an understanding when we say Naqshbandi bipolarity is that all Naqshbandis are bipolar. So means that there's a state in which to reach flatline. Flatline state is that you die before you die but because of the physiology and the spiritual practices and spiritual energy of people at first they come in they become very ecstatic, very happy for anything that opens for them, any energy or feeling they have as a result of our, our understandings and the way we teach of bipolarity not again according to Freudian and licensed psychologists this is, is, this is this Islamic Sufi perspective is that these are the two bipolar points of your flatline. Means that you're going to two polarities, instead of being flatlined you're going up and you're going down. So when they look at you, you're going too high when you're getting excited, ah, so happy, oh, yeah, you want the whole world to know how happy you are, your polarity is up too high. And then that same person after a period of time also becomes too low. You look at them like somebody died, what happened? They're just depressed, they're just completely… So that these two points have to stop and that's why the perfection and the Kamil shaykhs are teaching, don't show your high. So we're not a people who yell and scream and have ecstatic, ecstatic moments or turrets out in public where they scream out turrets, where they scream out words in public. Have you heard, have you seen those ones? Yeah, that's not allowed because they're showing their polarity is going up too high and that has to come under control. So that, then you discipline yourself is that when good things happen and you feel like in the zikr uh, ecstasy is coming, control yourself and don't show it. If you're able just to think that people are watching me and I'm not going to show it to show myself as something different then you control it. If you can't stop it, whatever you're doing then sort of open your eyes and stop that feeling that coming to you. For if you should enter into that state in which people recognize you, you're screaming, you're yelling then you're consist consistently showing you don't know how to control the polarity up, your aesthetic high is too high and you're not able to control it. Then at the same time when you become saddened because maybe you expected something, you want to feel something again, it's not coming, these, emo these spiritual feelings they're not under our control. They don't come when we want them to come, they don't open when we want them to open because Allah's not submitting to us. Allah wants us to submit to Him. So that's why then the same time the shaykhs are teaching, expect nothing. Soon as you expect nothing and really expect nothing, you'll be surprised with something. Because anything happens then you're happy because you're not expecting anything. But at the same time it's teaching you to pull these two together. Go, don't be so high, bring it down and don't be so low especially in front of people, your family, children, nothing, bring it back until you look at the person and say, we never even knew like you're, you're experiencing happiness or that you're extremely sad. They shouldn't, they're not able to help you anyways, everything's in Allah's hands. So it means your facial expression, your emotion shouldn't be known by anyone. So that becomes then towards the ocean of perfection. So either they're way out on the poles, so these are bipolar, two different poles. Then they slowly learn how to bring them in, bring them in, bring them in and then perfection they're like flatline. Then they're the happy nor sad but inside they're always thankful to Allah, alhamdulillah for what you gave and alhamdulillah for what you took because it had all the wisdom in it. So our life is to try to be flatline not to show the state up, not to show the state down. So anyone coming on a path of struggling of course then they're going to have to go through that experience. So that's why I say, oh Naqshbandis, if they're doing the programs right, they're meditating, contemplating, of course then they're going to be extremely ecstatic at the beginning and then they become really sad because it didn't happen again. 
So then how to pull themselves together and then to, to reach towards that reality. Now this has nothing to do with the mental illness, that's a different state. Mental illness, that's why the shaykhs don't deal with schizophrenia and true mental bipolar issues. That has to do with the neurons in their brain. So like computer wiring guys, let's say there's four wires that are supposed to be connected and then this is the conveyance of the, the brain wires, your brain is just the electrical wiring system. When all of these are connected, your thoughts, everything, you can go through all of these spiritual experiences like normal. You'll go up, you'll go down, so that doesn't change. But actual physical mental illness is when these wires start to not touch anymore. So your thought is coming here but you're reacting something different. So I'm saying one thing, you're hearing another thing because your receptors are not flowing with a clear connection. So that's something different that requires medicine to calm them down for them to, to reach. So true medical psychology we don't get involved with, whether they need medicine and they need to sort of fix those issues, those medicines then they have to take. So that's different between the spiritual practices and those whom their, their, their wires are off. Then you talk to them and they're smiling and laughing at you saying they heard something else. That's not tariqah, that's not spirituality. You talk to them they go out and harm themselves and harm other people, that's, that's not spirituality. And you talk to them they want to jump off the roof and think they can fly. So tariqah doesn't deal with anything like that, inshaAllah. Uh, As Salaamu Sayyidi Walaykum As Salaam wa rahmatullah During the meditation and for energy <coughs> practices what do we do with the, the, for grounding the left hand and the right hand and which hand should we hold the asa in? Yeah, whatever hand you, you want to. <laughs> whatever hand you're holding then the other hand you can be grounding. So the, the asa is a, it's its own grounding. So if you're holding the asa it's already grounding. So if I'm going to meditate like for the zikr then I have the asa here, I don't have to ground it. The, the asa is the one grounding. I can connect my other hand to feel my heart. So when I don't have the asa we're talking grounding. When I don't have the cane and I'm sitting on the ground then I'll put one hand down onto the ground and the other one I'm connecting with my connection to feel my heart and the other hand is on the ground to push the negative energy because it's all just natural common sense. Energy is coming in positive so where is it going to go out negative? So I have to give a place for the negative to be pushed out. So I breathe in all this energy and I hold something so negative energy can be pushed out of me. And if I'm going to hold this hand to meditate then I'm going to put the other hand to discharge any negative charge within me. The asa does that anyway, so that if I'm holding the asa that's the one that's grounding. If I'm holding the asa on the right hand then the right hand is grounding inshaAllah. Uh, As Salaamu Sayyidi how to deal with past issues? How to deal with past issues? <laughs> InshaAllah. To, to leave them exactly like you said, in the past, inshaAllah. The, the one who can cut the past and not worry about the future, he can fly. Right? The past is over, what can you do about it? By submitting to it that whatever Allah wrote it happened. If you did bad in the past make istighfar, forgive me Ya Rabbi today is a new day and I'll address you with a new tajalli. And the future it's not in your control so why worry about it? So when you truly every day live with forget about the past and don't worry about the future just today live in the moment then you should feel the ecstasy and the reality of that moment because these are two ropes that shaitan is holding you down by. How can you fly when you're worried about the future? And when you're worried about the future it has to do with lack of faith. Because shaitan coming and telling you, you're not going to make it, you're not going to have anything, you're going to be hungry, you're going to be dead, you're going to be sick, you're going to be… Then Allah comes and says, didn't I feed you till now? Did I ask you how I'm going to feed you? Did I get your advice on how I'm going to feed you? 
So no, so I will feed you until I put you into the grave. What are you worried about? You do your actions, you do your zikr, you do your prayers, you do all that which makes Allah happy, then the future is not in your hands. You do a lot of good deeds then alhamdulillah Allah inshaAllah write a beautiful future because that's your good deeds will warrant those things. The love for Prophet opened many doors because that will be to the love and the ishq of Sayyidina Muhammad So we're just busy with our amma. So that day I should be worried about only my amma, my zikr, my awrahs, my recitations, my connection. Then Allah makes that day to be beatific because you feel all these energies. And at the same time I didn't have to worry about tomorrow, so no because that's not your business tomorrow. You woke up, do your zikr, do your meditation, do your connection, do whatever you can. You got to go to work then do that before that or do that when you get home at the end, connect, thing, don't worry about it. And when you learn to live like that and try and struggle in that understanding then you, that day you will make beatific, that day you will make it to be blessed with Allah's tajallis and blessings and then again you do that tomorrow. Then before you know it you live 30 days not worrying about tomorrow and then Allah says, well weren't those 30 days good I fed you, you have a home, you have housing, you have children, you have family, you have everything, inshaAllah. As Salaamu Sayyidi <coughs> Walaykum As Salaam wa Does every human have this reality of cells moving towards the Divine Love and reality even when they are doing wrong and in ignorance? Khalaq <laughs> insan, yeah sure I created all this creation in haqq. <coughs> Your soul is from the light of the Divinely Presence and that soul is created in truth. The truth is in a ishq and love for Allah The soul of every zalim and believer is pure. Their zulamat from their physicality is attempting to impurify the soul but it cannot reach. They darken and, and take away the energy from the soul to experience what it has to. Although they wish to extinguish the light of Allah they cannot extinguish that light, right? So the zulamat of the body, that's why Allah will punish the body and free the soul. So one of the realities of the qab is that Allah will make an animal to appear like their nafs and the nafs will be punished and the body will be punished for what it was doing of badness. But the soul is never punished, the soul, soul looks around and soul just wants to be free from this garbage. That all this oppression you put upon me like a thorns into my reality, it's hoping to get rid of that body and get rid of that personality, inshaAllah. Uh, As Salaamu Sayyidi Walaykum As Salaam wa if we see a jinn, does that always mean they are from the bad jinn? If you see a jinn, is it always from the bad jinn? I, I can't answer that in, 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 a, in a general term that wouldn't be fair. But to understand the, the bad creatures, they show themselves anytime they want to scare you that's how they, they exist. Um, good in the sense of a believer but not a mu'min, so he may have the right to do that too because he can appear at any time. And it's like going to the mosque and saying, this guy next to me he's praying but then he stole something from my wallet but he's in a mosque, how's he doing that? He's Muslim and he does bad things. So that I've, I've watched cameras where they show people praying, they, they steal the zakat bucks and go. Maybe they're hungry, they need it, that's up to them. But you know anyone with a belief could do anything but mu'min is different. They took their, their bayat with Allah and swore an allegiance and that allegiance calls for them not to intervene with humans, not to interfere with their light, their, their, their understandings, anything. Now if Allah puts an exception or their shaykh puts an exception for something that I want you to be introduced to that mu'min and that's a guard, that's this, that, that's something separate. 
So they can be sent to be introduced to somebody as a guardian to know that this guard is with you, don't be scared, that's something completely separate. But those whom took their allegiance they don't interfere with humanity. Remember anyone, even if a shaykh all of a sudden appears in your home it would frighten everyone. So that's not a part of their command, that's not a part of, of what Allah wants them to do. So their work is always of a hidden work, praying for people. When you pray and you go into your room and you make your, your salat, do you think you're alone? Salaamu Alaikum Ibadullahi Salihin That you're saying in the words that Allah taught us to say, Assalamu Alaikum Ayyuhan Nabi, so means that the Muhammadan light is present, inshaAllah will be present because you're giving salams and Ibadullahi Salihin and the pious servants of Allah Zawajah. So even in your prayer Allah is telling us to give salams to these pious servants, they're all around you. So you're never alone, they're always around. If you sit and meditate then yeah, Budal, Nujab, Nuqab, then these categories of awliya there are present with you working on your heart and your soul to purify and to correct and to perfect. But doesn't mean they want to whoo, appear, hello and then make you scream and yell and <laughs> to leave. It's not the purpose that's like nafsani, why, why to do that? They don't want a recognition. So then for them to be there and spiritually perfect the heart and to perfect the character is the only importance. And Allah when He looked to the servant, He doesn't look to their form. So teaching also to them, don't look to their form, that go in a spiritual reality and address their spiritual issues. So don't reduce your connection to the form and to show your form and to be visible to their form. So these are of a different understanding inshaAllah. As <coughs> Ya Sayyidi Walaykum As Salaam Is there any correlation between the levels of the nafs and the levels of the heart? Please forgive my ignorance. Sure, I'm sure there's a correlation to, to everything. Everything is connected. The levels of the nafs, the seven levels, the seven verses of uh, Surat Al Fatiha, the seven levels of the heart. The seven tawaf of the Kaaba, everything is, is interconnected, inshaAllah. That the highest level of the nafs is Bismillahir Rahmanir Raheem, we said the gate is reversed, right? So nafs amara is linked to, Ya kana wa yakana ista etana sirat al mustaqim, sirat al ladina anamta alayhim wa idil maghdubi alayhim wa nad daleem. That's the ones of Amara that they angered Allah and they went astray. That's why the shaykh's gate is at nafs Amara to catch people. The shaykh doesn't deal with only the people who have the secret of Bismillahir Rahmanir Raheem. That's why we say all the zawiyas of the shaykhs they're on the ones they're catching the people whom angered Allah and went astray. So that's why other people come and say, what are all these people, why, why you deal with these people? It's because uh, they're catching people to bring them back to Allah And their da'wah is based on bringing these people who went astray back to Allah 